In the 1970s, two engineering philosophies battled for control of the agricultural and construction equipment markets, as operators demanded engines that could survive harsh conditions without constant maintenance. Perkins had dominated the compact diesel market for decades that powered everything from tractors to generators. Deutz was the German challenger with a radical design. By 1978, one approach would prove superior in the field. This is the story of how Deutz's technology offered a fundamentally different approach to diesel engine reliability. Water-cooled diesels depend on a chain of parts working together. Fan, shroud, radiator core, pump, thermostat, cap, hoses, and clamps. In hard service, any weak link shows up as heat you cannot carry away fast enough, and that is when engines derate, boil, or stop. A big driver is the mismatch between heat rejection and fan airflow at working RPM. Field work often happens at moderate engine speed with heavy load. The pump and fan both move less at those RPM, yet the cylinder heat load is high. If the shroud is not sealed or the core is partially blocked, the fan recirculates warm air inside the compartment, instead of pulling cool air through the fins. Temperatures creep up even before you see obvious debris on the grill. Dust loading is a pressure drop problem, not just a cleaning chore. As chaff or silica packs into the fin space, core resistance rises. That forces the fan to a worse operating point and reduces mass flow. Screens help, but they add their own restriction and must be serviced on schedule. If the machine has a reversible fan or a swing-out core, it buys time. Without those, crews end up power washing or blowing out cores during the shift. Cooling circuits also fail from the wet side. Centrifugal pumps can suffer seal wear, bearing wear, and cavitation if system pressure or coolant condition is poor. Thermostats stick, pressure caps lose spring pressure, and small leaks let air into the circuit. Air pockets at the pump inlet promote cavitation, which erodes impellers and cuts flow even more. Coolant chemistry matters. Hard water deposits scale on hot surfaces. Scale is a strong insulator and raises metal temperature. Wrong additive packages can drop out silicates and plug small passages, while neglected coolant turns acidic and attacks solder joints and aluminum. Good labs can catch this, but remote jobs often run what is on hand, which shortens service life. Environment compounds everything. Altitude lowers air density, so the same fan moves fewer kilograms of air per minute. High ambient narrows the temperature gradient across the core. Pressure caps raise the boiling point, but if the cap is weak or a hose weeps, the margin disappears. In brush or demolition work, the issue is impact. A single bent tube can start a leak and a slow drain ends in an overheat. All of this shows up as maintenance load. Crews spend time flushing systems, changing hoses, chasing weeps, testing caps and thermostats, and carrying a lot of spares. Shops need degreasing gear for cores, pressure testers, refractometers, and a shelf of model-specific hoses. The cost is not just parts. It is lost hours when the machine is supposed to be earning. That is the backdrop for why buyers asked for a different risk profile. They wanted fewer parts that could leak, fewer variables to monitor, and cooling performance that stayed predictable when conditions turned ugly. The Perkins 4 236 represented the conventional liquid-cooled approach. It displaced 236 cubic inches with a 3.87-inch bore and 5-inch stroke. And was offered in roughly 60 to 85 horsepower calibrations depending on application. Introduced in the mid-1960s, it used direct injection and became widely used in tractors, industrial equipment, and on-road derivatives. The 4236's cooling circuit followed the classic pattern. A radiator up front, a centrifugal pump pushing coolant through block and head passages, a thermostat modulating flow, and a pressure cap and expansion space to raise the boiling point and handle thermal growth. 
When everything was clean and sealed, this gave excellent temperature control and steady metal temperatures, great for longevity, cab heat, and predictable performance across the day. In the field, cooling depended as much on airflow management as on engine power. The engine-driven fan had to pull outside air through the radiator core rather than recirculate warm compartment air. Shrouds and side baffles kept the draw across the core, and a clean core kept pressure drop low. Many machines added debris screens or swing-out radiator packs so crews could keep the core face clear. If the air side passages filled with chaff or dust, restriction rose, fan mass flow fell, and coolant temperature climbed long before you saw steam. And anyone who ran these machines knew the rest of the story. Particles built where airflow was tightest. Chaff, silica, and cement dust packed the fin space, core resistance climbed, and the fan moved less cool air just as heat load rose. Mud and seed fluff matted the grill and a bent tube from brush or rock started a slow leak. Add altitude, which cut air density and high ambient, which shrank the temperature margin, and a clean sealed system could still get pushed over the edge. Reversible fans and swing-out cores helped, but only if crews stayed ahead of the debris. The wet side added its own risks. Pump seals and bearings wore. A slipping belt or a tired seal could quietly cut flow. A weak pressure cap lowered the boiling margin. Thermostats stuck or cycled late. Small weeps let air into the circuit, and air at the pump inlet promoted cavitation which pitted impellers and further reduced flow. Coolant quality mattered too. Hard water laid down scale on hot surfaces. Poor additive control dropped out silicates, and neglected coolant went acidic and attacked solder and aluminum. All of that translated into maintenance load and parts on the shelf. Shops pressure-tested caps, checked thermostat opening temperatures, inspected hoses and clamps, flushed and refilled coolant to spec, and kept radiators breathing. Dealers serving these fleets stocked the usual suspects, pumps and seal kits, caps, thermostats, hoses in several shapes and diameters, clamps, gasket sets, and radiator service options. Because any one of those items could be the reason a good engine had a bad day. Deutz's F4L 912 and 913 took a different path from conventional liquid-cooled diesels. The 912 was about 230 cubic inches from four cylinders, with a 3.94-inch bore and 4.72-inch stroke. Typically calibrated around 60 to 70 horsepower, near 2300 revolutions per minute. The 913 was roughly 249 cubic inches with power commonly in the 70 to 80 horsepower range depending on application. Both families ran moderate to high compression ratios, typically around 17 to 1 to 18 to 1, which supported steady torque at working speeds. Unlike traditional water-cooled engines, the Deutz 912 and 913 were air-cooled, meaning they relied entirely on airflow to dissipate engine heat rather than using a radiator and liquid coolant. This approach simplified the engine design by eliminating the need for components like water pumps, radiators, and hoses, reducing maintenance demands and potential failure points. Air-cooled engines must shed heat directly from the metal surfaces, so their design emphasizes efficient airflow and heat transfer, which plays a central role in how these engines are built and operated. Each cylinder was an individual finned cast iron barrel, typically topped by a cast iron or finned aluminum head, depending on the model and application. A crankshaft-driven axial fan sat inside a full sheet metal shroud, so incoming air was forced across the fin surfaces instead of recirculating in the engine bay. With no radiator, water pump, thermostat, hoses, or coolant to manage, the failure modes shifted from leaks and clogged cores to two controllables, keep the shroud sealed and keep the fins clean. Baffles and shrouds were fitted tight so the fan drew outside air, pushed it over the hot zones and vented it where the machine builder intended. 
Many installations added thermostatically controlled cooling air flaps that metered flow during warm-up and helped stabilize head temperature under changing loads. Where the application was especially dusty, builders often specified easy access panels so fins could be blown clean quickly. Oil carried more of the load than many operators expected. These engines used a robust lubrication system with full flow filtration, and many industrial models were equipped with an external oil cooler to handle the thermal load of air-cooled duty. Oil not only lubricated bearings and valve train, it also removed a meaningful share of heat from pistons, heads, and guides. Service intervals and oil grades were specified with that thermal role in mind, which was why staying on spec mattered for longevity. Fuel and controls were deliberately simple. A mechanically governed inline pump metered fuel to conventional injectors for predictable response at field speeds with minimal electronics. Timing gear trains drove the pump and auxiliaries. The all-speed governor used on many applications held RPM under varying load, which was exactly what you wanted on implements, compressors, and construction machines that saw constant load swings. Serviceability was a major part of the appeal. Because each cylinder was its own barrel and head, a technician could address one problem cylinder without pulling the whole power unit. Valve setting, injector swaps, and fin cleaning were straightforward jobs with basic tools. If the fins filled with chaff, a few minutes with compressed air restored airflow. If a shroud was bent, it could be removed, straightened, and refitted without draining anything. The 913 refined the 912's formula. Displacement per cylinder was higher, airflow and fin geometry were revised in many applications, and the package supported higher power in the same basic envelope. For equipment builders, losing the radiator opened packaging options. Skid steer loaders, compact tractors, pumps, compressors, and generators could be laid out with shorter hoods, fewer guards around a front-mounted core, and less vulnerability to punctures or clogging. There were trade-offs, but they were manageable. Air-cooled engines tracked ambient temperature more closely than water-cooled designs, so shroud integrity and fin cleanliness mattered. They warmed quickly after start, which was useful in cold work, but cab heat usually needed a dedicated heater circuit. Fan and mechanical noise were more present because there was no water jacket to dampen sound. In return, you avoided coolant chemistry issues, pump seals and hoses, and the downtime that came with chasing leaks or cleaning clogged radiator cores. In short, the 912 and 913 families exchanged a web of wet parts for a disciplined airflow path over finned metal. That design choice explained why these engines built a reputation for staying on the job when dust and debris made liquid-cooled packages high-maintenance. By 1978, buyers stopped debating and started standardizing. Air-cooled for harsh duty. What actually changed on spec sheets and in shops was concrete. Equipment builders that offered both engines began steering harsh-duty customers to the 912 and 913 options and bundling practical add-ons. Easy access panels for fin cleaning, sealed side baffles, and the debris screens that could be flipped or removed without tools. Purchasing checklists shifted too. Instead of stocking radiator cores and pump kits, fleets added spare shrouds, belts, and pre-cut foam seals, plus a simple air wand kit at fuel islands. Operators adopted new routines. Fin blow-off became a fuel-up task. Shroud seal checks moved into the daily walk-around. Oil management got more attention because the cooler and full-flow filtration were doing real thermal work. Shops tied valve and injector checks to the oil interval to keep head temps consistent. Mechanics who used to pressure test caps and chase weeps were now taught airflow diagnostics. Look for recirculation paths, missing seals, bent tins, and dust shadows on fins. A packed fin stack could be cleared and the machine returned to work in minutes. Packaging changed as well. Without a front radiator, builders shortened hoods and reduced puncture risk in brush and rubble. That meant fewer slow leaks that turned into overheats later in the shift. Those practical differences are why the air-cooled box got ticked for hot, dusty jobs and stayed that way after 1978.